In this episode, Tom Fox and Megan Doherty take up Loki, Season 2, Episode 5, Science Fiction. Megan Doherty, we are running towards the penultimate episode here of Loki, Episode 5, and we're starting to get two things that really intrigue me. One is great science fiction, but two is some interesting character developments. And I don't know if you saw something different in Episode 5, um, but what were your initial thoughts? Uh, my initial thoughts was just um, utter and complete delight to get to see everyone's origin story. They made some great choices with those. I, I thought it was so much fun how we got to kind of see where, where everyone was. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you like that bit too. Did you have a favorite uh, character's origin story? Well, um, yes and no. Yes, but then when I went back and reviewed them all and actually wrote them down so I could go through them for our podcast, I loved them all. Um, so you have to start with Mobius. He's mm. Don in Cleveland selling I jet called skis. Midwest. I totally called it earlier in the season. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, it was just, it, it even gets better in episode six, but we'll talk about mm. that in episode six. Uh, Obi, uh, Ouroboros. Pasadena, California, 1994, a brilliant scientist, but failed sci-fi writer. Uh, pretty clearly, you can see how and where he's going as the brilliant scientist. What I did not fully appreciate what, until this, um, because of the failed writer aspect, was when he uh, co-authored the handbook mm -hmm. um, with Timely. So uh, I thought that was a pretty cool. Uh, I loved uh, I loved his name, his original name, yeah. A.D. Doug, Douglas Adams. Right. What a great call out. Perhaps the most intriguing to me was Casey, who was Frank Morris. Frank Morris. Now that <laughs> Frank Morris is, in spite of Megan's visual reaction, there is not a name that's at the top of mind of most people, but he is one of three people who are alleged to have escaped from Alcatraz, <laughs> and uh, he did leave the facility. It's not clear if he survived going across San Francisco Bay into San Francisco so that he survived his escape. But he did escape Alcatraz, and he's one of three. So uh, I thought that was incredibly cool. Well, of course, and um, now we know what happened to him. He didn't <laughs> drown. He didn't get away. He was picked up to form, help form the TVA. Plainly. Plainly. Well, and, you know, even more to the point, uh, I think it was in 2023, uh, person came forward saying he was Frank Morris, and now it makes sense. Now we understand why. <laughs> <laughs> he was a variant on a timeline. Makes perfect sense. Um, B-15. Mm. He was Dr. Willis in New York City in 2012. Oh, so, so sweet. Uh, sweet. Uh, so it was, uh, all of those were very, very cool. Um, it took me a couple of viewings to understand the time slipping nature of what was going on when the first time I saw it I thought well it was just time slipping to time slip that's not it at all or I don't think it's it at all I think it was his attempts to learn to control time slipping mm -hmm. so that he he could go where he wanted and so once I kind of came to that realization it began to make more sense and I began to see where this might be going um, towards uh, episode six uh, what were your thoughts around that part of it I think it was it was the whole process of learning that you know his ability to control the flow of time and his own time slipping it was it was all about the people and this I think it came through a lot in this episode and it, it kept getting stronger and stronger through the next one which I know we'll talk about more soon but just that Loki is building a family it's all he's ever wanted he's got these people he cares about that he's working with. he's got his own Avengers finally and that's what's giving him the power to do this impossible thing. Uh, I, I thought it was, I thought it was delightful. Uh, I thought it was really nice to see him connecting with others, uh, in that way. Once again, I think it really ties together in episode six, but frankly, I had never considered Loki as wanting a family. And that's a huge bit of growth for him as yeah. big a growth, frankly, as any other MCU character, whether major or minor. And so, um, he really does want to be around those he loves. And that becomes very, very clear uh, in this episode. So um, that part was fascinating for me as well. Oh, yeah. And just, and I think especially in his, 
uh, communicate like in his conversation with Sophie or Sylvie about it. Uh, yes. She was the only one who remembered him because she had the ultimate time pad. And I think she had chosen her place in, in the branch timelines and just the experiences they had growing up were so different, but had so many similarities in terms of their ultimate loneliness and their regular failures. Uh, it, it just, yeah, I like that she ended up palling in with them, even though they, they fundamentally disagreed on some of the ethics behind what they were, you know, should the TVA exist? How should these timelines be managed? Uh, you don't always have to have to like your family to love them. <laughs> so one of the key themes uh, I thought in this episode, I hit on it a little bit, what, but it's basically the question, what makes Loki tick? And, mm -hmm. you know, we saw him evolve in the Thor movies. Uh, about his competition with his brother Thor in Asgard, and they're both joint sort of trying to get their father's affection so that they could become king of Asgard when he passed. But also I thought back to season one where we saw a lot of, I think now we know are variant Lokis, but just how selfish he was and mm -hmm. how self-centered he could be. Uh, not that he would, you know, tell someone he loved them and, and kick them out of bed the next day, but um, to say that uh, he maybe used and abused people for his own selfish gain or pleasure, uh, I think was really one of the themes I saw from season one. So, um, you know, emotional growth, spiritual growth, maybe it was him recognizing um, it, it, it's not them, it's me. And I, I just want to be around the people I love or at least my friends. So that I thought was pretty significant. Oh, I think it was too, and I think uh, it um, uh, it it becomes more clear uh, in the finale. But you know, his always his striving for glorious purpose, glorious purpose, and he's never understood until now when I think he's starting to learn it that purpose can't be only about yourself. Purpose almost always has uh, some element of you know being for others uh, or for the greater good. And he's, he's I think he's starting to get it for the first time ever, which was kind of heart-wrenching to see all of that time he's wasted <laughs> that's not fair boys can grow up too um and just some of us it takes a little bit longer than others of you all um because you know he did start off as the god of mischief and yeah. in norse mythology he was the god of mischief and he certainly was that in the first at least the first two four movies uh maybe the first avengers movie as well so um some really interesting development in his relationship with Sylvie at the end of season one, I thought it was close to becoming lovers. I don't think they're lovers. I think they're, and it's not brother and sister. It's something closer, mm -hmm. but it's not physically consummated. Did you have any thoughts on that one way or the other? Um, I thought it was definitely more sibling-ish than anything else. And I, I don't know, I've definitely got people in my life for whom like, the structure of the relationship took many, many years to emerge in its final form. And I've always landed on cousin for that. <laughs> but I, I agree. I think it's, it's it, maybe twins, if not just kind of normal <laughs> brother and sister, maybe twins. Um, because he, they needed, he needed to be able to talk to her, having that foil, uh, another version of himself to really be able to understand his own motivations. Cause I think he saw himself so much in Sylvie uh, and that was the the impetus for the growth because uh, he probably never knew how aggravating he could be <laughs> if nothing else. Oh boy of course <laughs> it's all about me what do you mean aggravating to others what others uh i mean it's it's not his fault necessarily you know too much power is bad for everyone and i assume especially gods <laughs> you know <laughs> you know it's interesting around sylvie because the first couple of times i watched episode five I thought he was helping her heal because I thought it was him kind of leading to a point where she didn't kill uh, he who remains um, or didn't slay him. And uh, once again, we'll see a little bit more of that in uh, episode six. And then uh, the, sec the last couple of viewings of episode five, I really saw the growth in Loki that I hadn't seen previously. So that was an interesting kind of twist because I really thought he was the one who was almost counseling her. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got to let go of this anger and you've got to move on to whatever that is. And he, he was so desperately hopeful that that would be the thing that saved everyone. You know, he's like, if I can just get through 
to so to Sylvie, this is going to it's it, you know it's going to be the the inciting incident that doesn't happen that's going to make everything okay. And right. he, he just wanted that so badly because he loves her. <laughs> that he does, and and I'm very comfortable in saying that. Uh, like I said, I wasn't quite sure what plane of love. I think in the Greek language, I learned there are four, I think it's 17 different words mm. for love. And uh, so it's much more precise than English um, We're around that word. And I'm not sure which love it landed on, but it's certainly very, something very in between the, the Yeah, something in between like philia and family, <laughs> something right. between friendship and family. <laughs> so any final thoughts on episode five other than I'm going to say I could, I've seen it now, but I couldn't wait for episode six based <laughs> on episode five. The, the, the last one is... um. I thought it was kind of uh, one of the, the final scenes when all of the, let's call them Loki's Avengers, are all in the room uh, and they're getting spaghettified one by one by the time radiation. And they all have this kind of final line, this kind of final moment. And it just brought me right back to the end of Infinity War when people were getting dusted. Uh, and I thought just as, as an emotional chord to strike again, it was A+. plus. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, I guess I felt the same when I saw that. So on that note, we will end episode five, and hopefully you will join us for episode six. I'm Tom Fox. I'm Megan Dorney. See you then. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Because That's What Heroes Do. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll subscribe, rate, and review wherever great podcasts are listened to. Because That's What Heroes Do is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.